Okay, um, hello everyone and welcome to the fourth lecture on loop quantum gravity by Hal. Hal is going to continue to talk about how to build space and time. He will take a break in between to take questions and also at the end. So with that, thank you Hal and please go ahead. Thank you, Johanna, and welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, I've been way too ambitious today. I have something like 60 slides. So at some point I'm gonna have to just skip some slides and I apologize, I, I'm just sure I'm gonna run out of time, but I'll do my best and, uh, and as usual, we should, we should discuss. It's more interesting than just getting through all the slides. At the very least, I'll put them all in the PDF that gets posted on the school site and then you can look at anything that I didn't get to talk about. So I'll do the same thing I did the last time and, and begin with two review questions. Uh, once again, since there's the recording, I won't give a long pause for answering these, but uh, to kind of bring your heads back to where we were last week, the, the first is what are the conjugate variables that loop quantum gravity uses in its gauge theory description of general relativity? And we were just discussing this before we began recording, and uh, the answer is that we use these Ashtakar variables. So there's the electric field, which is a two form um, on space time or on the spatial slice of space time because we make a split of space time into space and time. And it has this I index, which we understood was an internal index that represents a local Lorentz frame vector. And then uh, what we uh, spent some time working on last uh, class was to variable to this electric field, and it turned out it was this Ashtakar connection, which was a remarkable combination of variables. Uh, on the one hand, to get conjugacy, we included the extrinsic curvature, K, or really uh, a we used the triad to convert the extrinsic curvature into having one uh, index of each type. And then uh, that gave us the conjugacy, but that alone wasn't a connection. But we realized we could add this uh, k variable to the spatial part of the standard levi chivita connection, or actually what we ended up working with was the spin connection. So little omega is the spin connection on our manifold. Um, a are its spatial components. Uh, Jk are its internal space uh, components. And we use the epsilon, another Hodge dual here, essentially, to convert that into uh, the same index structure as the other variables. And uh, we realize that we can always add a vector to a connection, and you don't change the fact that it's a connection. And so the Ashtakar connection was that combination of variables. With all of these choices and all the details, which I'm glossing over quickly here, what we found was that uh, these two variables, whoops, sorry, these two variables, A and E, uh, gave us a con canonically conjugate pair of variables for studying uh, classical general relativity. Uh, we talked a little bit about this gamma parameter. It's a real parameter in the theory. It represents the fact that we've made a canonical transformation to get to these variables. Uh, we understood that it has a physical consequence, which is that <clears throat> if you think of the uh, area spectrum, that is, if I'm measure a surface to have areas, uh, I only measure certain quantum values, and the, the spacing between those quantum values is controlled by this gamma parameter. So that's its physical interpretation. And uh, it's called the barbero Imirzi parameter. Uh, so with the, all of that summarized, we have the Ashkar variables, the connection commutes with itself, and the electric field density commutes with itself as well. All right, so that's the just a reminders. Um, the other piece that we've been talking a lot about was that there's a cat hiding in quantum gravity. Uh, of course, you know by now what I mean by this is that you can think of a tetrahedron as being the same uh, gauge theory system as a, as a falling cat. In the falling cat case, you have that the total angular momentum is zero. In the case of a tetrahedron described in these variables, you have the, the uh, sum of the Ashtakar electric field, or the flux really, all the way around the tetrahedron is zero. And this represents the same thing as for the cat, that is that the rotation, any rotation of this tetrahedron doesn't change its geometry. So that's gauge. Uh, 
Um, but there's also a way of thinking of this as generating that gauge. And as such, we realize that it should be thought of as an angular momentum. So this led us to the quantization, which I just remind you gives us that the areas are measured in units of Planck area and that their spectrum is described by the standard angular momentum algebra with uh, half integers J labeling the, the eigenvalues of the area operator. We also realized one other subtle and new thing that is different from the standard angular momentum theory that you're used to, which is that uh, we're not interested in every state of the tensor product of four angular momenta. We're only interested in those that satisfy closure. And so we should have that instantiated in our quantum theory too. That is, we need to pick out elements of the tensor product space, which are rotationally invariant. Uh, we call such elements intertwiners. Um, and here I'm blurring a, a line a little bit. We actually call the tensor that contracts the states to give the state that is rotationally invariant. We call that tensor an intertwiner, but I'm just gonna identify the two things. And to give you an example of something that could achieve this, I mentioned that the volume you can define as an operator on this quantum tetrahedron. And so you can label an intertwiner state by the face area quantum labels and by the volume quantum label. And now you have a well-defined quantum state that lives in this rotationally invariant subspace. I pointed out one other thing about this, which is schematically shown on the left here which is that um, this is only five uh, quantities. And you know that if you were to pin down a classical tetrahedron, you would need all six of its classical edge lengths. And so if we're only pinning down five of its classical properties, it, might, it must not be completely well-defined. And this is no surprise. It's like the fact that you can't uh, measure the position and momentum of a quantum particle perfectly. Uh, there, there's an Heisenberg uncertainty, and there's an exact analog of this here, which is that we're leaving one classical variable of the tetrahedron unfixed, and as such, we're not actually completely fixing its metrical geometry. So it's more like a, uh, a fuzzy tetrahedron was the, the language I was using last time. Okay, so that's all to set the stage for the many things we're going to explore today. And uh, as I've been doing, uh, oh, I wanted to make one other summary point, excuse me. Uh, so at the very end last time, we also mentioned uh, the observables that we're going to work with. And here there was this beautiful thing that uh, I really think loop gravity is unique in bringing together, which is that if we have a connection, we know that a nice set of observable, ob observables related to that connection are the holonomies, the uh, path-ordered exponential integrals of that connection around a closed loop. Those are observables. The trouble with those in a standard gauge theory, if it was really a gauge theory in the continuum, is that if you deformed your loop just a little bit, you'd get another observable we then end up with an uncountably infinite number of observables and it would be impossible to, to keep track of all of that and uh, quantize your, your Hilbert space. Gravity has the amazing feature that it's also supposed to be a gauge theory with respect to diffeomorphisms. So if we make a small shift of our loop in gravity, we don't really consider that to be a different loop as long as we didn't change something about its knotted structure or how it's linked and all of these sorts of things. And so uh, this feature allows us to use the holonomies once again as good observables in quantum gravity. So um, spin networks, the idea of what a spin network is, is that they provide a, a basis of the independent loops of a graph. And it's a very convenient basis to work in. And I'll say a little bit more about it today, but I have to confess, I'm not gonna be able to give you the full details. So uh, I'll refer you to the literature a little here too. So the spin networks I've drawn very schematically on the left here on each spatial slice, we have some graph and we label that graph with irreps of SU2. And uh, they're gonna, the, the links of that graph are the, the transverse, that is, if we have a link of the graph, it pierces a surface area, and that uh, label on it tells us how much area that surface has. 
So these are just a way of keeping track of the electric fluxes that we've been thinking about. And then the intertwiners label the nodes of the spin network, and they tell you, for example, how much volume that has, although volume's not the only observable you can use to intertwine things. And we'll talk about that a bit later on. Okay, so that's all of the summary. Uh, as I've been doing, I'll, I'll start with a little bit less technical things so that we can kind of get our heads in the game, and then uh, I'll proceed to more technical stuff. And today, uh, I want to discuss primarily the geometry of space-time, and I want to start to bring dynamics into the game. So those are the two features I'm going to uh, be talking a lot about today. And I'll start with a simplified example uh, from the tetrahedral uh, story we've been telling to give you some idea of this. So there's a beautiful formulation, which if you've never encountered it, I, I re highly recommend. It's um, a paper by John Baez and Bunn, and it's in the American Journal of Physics, which is a nice journal that uh, tries to publish more pedagogical papers. And what they do is they reformulate the Einstein equations, and they try to give you a very intuitive picture of what they mean and what they're doing. And the idea is that they consider a ball of test particles. So remember, a test particle has a small enough mass that you can neglect its effect on the surrounding space-time geometry. And so they're just supposed to be probes of the geometry around them and not have very significant effect. So very schematically, here's a ball, and I'm thinking of a solid ball of tons and tons of test particles. So what Baez and Bunn describe is if you pick the ball at the center, you can use its proper time as a notion of time for the ball. If we, if we take the ball small enough, that's a good approximation, and we get a local inertial frame associated with that central particle, and we're going to use its time as our measurement of time. And uh, you work through all the details, and it takes a little bit of work. You go through the standard uh, Einstein tensor equals stress energy tensor story, and the Einstein equations boil down to this single equation on the top left here. Uh, v is the volume of this ball of test particles. T is the proper time of the central particle, as we were just saying. And what the Einstein equation says is that the second derivative of the volume of the ball divided by the volume of the ball, evaluated at the initial time, the evolution of the volume of the ball, in other words, is given by the stress energy. Here, rho is the energy density, and P are the pressures. So this is a beautiful formulation. It turns out all the uh, complicated tensor structure of the Einstein equations comes from taking this equation and requiring that it be general covariant. That is requiring that it hold in every reference frame. So, so if you just want to understand it in one reference frame, the, the one of this central particle, this is the whole story. And we've been talking a lot uh, in this course about vacuum Einstein theory. So let's take the energy density and pressures to vanish. In that case, well, this denominator, as long as this ball has non-zero volume, I can just multiply it out. And we have the, the Einstein equations become a very simple set of equations. It's just that the second derivative of the volume of this test particle ball vanishes. It only does so at the initial time. But you've actually seen this before. Have you ever seen these pictures of uh, schematic pictures of gravitational waves? You know, they usually draw a, a ring of test particles, and they imagine the gravitational wave coming through the ring. And what the gravitational uh, wave does is deform the test particle ring like this, and then deform it the other way and back and forth, right? As the wave goes through, that's what it does. Well, now we're just doing a more sophisticated version of that. We're imagining what the gravitational wave would do to the whole ball. And it does the same thing. It deforms it into an ellipsoid, and then it goes back to a sphere and deforms it into an ellipsoid the other direction. And that's the, the net effect of the gravitational wave. And the, the geometrical fact, which is what I find so interesting here, is that the volume of that ball of test particles doesn't change to second order in time. So it's really uh, higher order in time effects that start to, to deform the volume of the ball. All right. There's a reason I'm explaining this way of thinking about things. I want you to notice that the test particles are giving us a way to probe the gravitational field. 
And so one of the things that we're going to do a lot today, and I want uh, to try to clarify, is we're going to throw away a bunch of the test particles. That is, what I'm going to do is throw away almost all of them and ask, what can I probe if I just keep four test particles, four test particles distributed in space? Clearly, I'm not getting all the information about how the gravitational wave, for example, is deforming the test particles. I couldn't. I only have four left, but I do get some information about them. And uh, in particular, I can kind of interpolate what kind of information I get as the information about a tetrahedron. So what I'm doing is I'm very much adopting this local frame perspective, and I'm thinking of this tetrahedron as having a flat interior, and the only degrees of freedom uh, of the gravitational field that I'm describing are the face area of the tetrahedron and how the face areas are, faces are related one to another. In other words, the dihedral angles of this tetrahedron, if you think of taking those normal vectors and dot producting them together. Notice, and this is the key point that I really want to make strongly, that you don't have to interpolate these four particles, which is the only information I have, with a polyhedron. That's just a choice. It's just a way to fill in what it is that I'm trying to understand from the finite data set that I have of just the positions of these four test particles. So um, it's essential throughout to keep in mind that this is a choice. Uh, I think an analogy is really helpful here. Uh, you know this well from if you've ever played with digital music or thought about any sort of signal processing. Um, what you have when you have signal processing is you're, you're often not sampling a, a signal continuously. You're not finding the voltage of some circuit continuously. You're just sampling it at a discrete set of points. So when you do that sampling, all you get are these discrete points. But often when you want to do mathematics on that discrete set of points, you want to interpolate the points. And you have lots of different choices when you interpolate them. You could interpolate them with a smooth polynomial, for example. And you know that if you add more parameters to the polynomial, that is, you add more and more powers of the variable, you'll get better and better fits to this finite data set. But you have more and more parameters in your fit, right? Or you could interpolate with straight lines between each one. Or you could really treat it as a kind of digital signal. That is, you could measure the voltage and then measure the voltage and measure the, and you would have this sort of piecewise flat or uh, interpolation of the signal. And what I want to point out is that the polyhedra are like one of these choices. Turns out I'm sort of thinking of the polyhedra as this piecewise linear interpolation. Of course, they're a higher dimensional version of this, but it makes sense that, that I'm, I'm filling in between the data that I actually have to get a, a picture of what I'm doing. So in gravity, we do this all the time. The polynomial is a lot like a, a mode expansion in, in cosmology or the piecewise linear is about uh, Reggie calculus. I'll tell you much more about Reggie calculus later today. Uh, and the piecewise flat, uh, that actually has an analog here also. Um, it's what's called a twisted geometry in loop quantum gravity. We still represent grains of space by polyhedra, but we no longer require that the polyhedra glue nicely at a face. So for example, if I had a triangular face on the left, triangular face on the right, they may not match up perfectly. They may be twisted one with respect to the other. And it's a lot like this digital interpolation because you see there's a discontinuity at every step from one data to the next. That same discontinuity is happening in a twisted geometry. So I think it's really good when I tell you that I'm talking about a, a tetrahedron in quantum gravity, I don't mean to be telling you that space is made up of lots of tiny tetrahedra, right? If you took me literally and thought it was a metaphysical claim that there were tetrahedra building everything, that's a bit strong. Um, what I'm really doing is modeling the finite degree number of degrees of freedom that I'm capturing by tetrahedra because it gives me a nice geometrical model that fits with all the geometrical formulation of general relativity. 
So I just don't want you to overread into the, the interpolation that we're using here. I can try and say this one more way. And it, I think it was partly starting to come up in the questions last time. It's partly why I wanted to give this prologue. Um, discreteness shows up in loop gravity in different ways. And those different ways uh, have a rich interplay with each other. So often uh, today, I'll be talking about a finite graph. I'll label such graphs capital gamma. And I'm talking about something like this, where I have nodes connected by links in this picture here. And uh, what I mean when I say that I'm working on a fixed graph, that is, I'm just going to only talk about this graph in this picture right here, is that I'm truncating the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. I'm no longer using a network that probes every part of spacetime. I'm just probing this region right here. And even more, I'm only probing it so finely. And so that truncation of the number of degrees of freedom is a very important move because it allows me to study things kind of in a simplified setting. Um, but that truncation is just that. It's a truncation. It's not saying that gravity doesn't have more degrees of freedom. It says I'm only studying some of those. So there's that kind of discreteness showing up. Second kind is the interpolation kind of discreteness I was just mentioning. You have different ways of filling in what you mean by a grain of space uh, when you when you decide to think of this node as being represent, representing a region of space. So I've been telling you a lot about the tetrahedral way of thinking about it. And here I've drawn the picture, or my colleagues have drawn the picture of a polyhedral way of doing it. Um, and both of those features, the truncation and the interpolation, both of those are separate kinds of discreteness from the physical prediction of loop quantum gravity. And the physical prediction is a quantum prediction, right? It's that we have a quantum spectral discreteness. When we measure geometrical quantities in general relativity, like the flux, which we know represents area, or the volume operator, operator we get discrete spectra. So that's the true discreteness. That's the, if, in my language from before, that's the metaphysical claim. If you were able to probe space-time at Planck scales, you would start to see this uh, fundamental quantum discreteness. Now, that fundamental quantum discreteness might make truncations like this make more sense, right? Because maybe there are no degrees of freedom beyond the Planck scale. Um, but, uh, but I don't want you to confuse the two. They're, they're separate things, and they're both interesting. All right, so that's the, the main message of my uh, prologue here. Uh, let me give you a quick outline as to how today is going. Uh, so last time we started building up space, uh, and I want to try and summarize a little bit more. So I'll tell you a bit more about spin networks. As I was confessing at the outset, um, I think I'm going to have to summarize a little here because I really want to get you to dynamics today. And so, uh, so I'm going to try to give you some pointers to the literature, but mostly just give you an overview of spin networks. In the second part, I'll tell you uh, about the tetrahedral anomaly. It's actually something we've already discussed, but I want to put an emphasis on it because it's going to show up in the discrete geometry path integrals that we're going to do in the third part today, which are what we call spin foams. I'm going to introduce you to something called an effective spin foam. It's just one type of spin foam model, um, although it does encompass the other models in principle. Uh, it's not the standard one that everybody uh, usually introduces you to. They usually introduce you to the EPRL, Eng Engel, Pereira, Rovelli, and Levine, or the FK, the Friedel Krasnov spin foam models. They're both uh, beautiful spin foam models. They have they're basically the same. It's been proved now. Um, those two those models are the standard introduction to spin foams. Uh, I'm partly doing this other introduction because It'll complement other things you can find in the literature and online, um, and uh, partly because it ties very much to the geometry we've been discussing. So that's my plan for today. So let's begin with this uh, summary of spin networks. Okay, 
my main message to you here is if you want to get deeper into loop quantum gravity, one place that you can get a lot, a lot of uh, understanding and perspective and uh, technology is from lattice gauge theory. Uh, there's actually quite a number of parallels between loop quantum gravity's approach and lattice gauge theory. So I'll start off discussing those parallels, uh, but I also want to emphasize that there are a few key differences. And whenever you reach out for a lattice gauge theory tool, uh, you should double check, wait, uh, can I use this tool in loop quantum gravity, or in particular in a theory of general relativity, where we're also going to have diffeomorphism uh, ideas at play. So uh, a couple of the analogies, um, one is that there's a Hilbert space that's constructed over a graph. In lattice gauge theory, they usually use a regular graph, and sometimes I'll draw pictures that way today, but in loop gravity, there's no reason to use a, like, a regular graph. Um, we use holonomies, or these Wilson loops, uh, as basic variables. We've seen that they're related to the connection variable in the Ashtakar formulation, and so they provide sort of half of our basic variables. The other half are the fluxes, uh, which measure areas. And uh, in lattice gauge theory, you impose gauge invariance at the nodes of the graph, and the same thing happens in loop gravity. These are the intertwiners we've been discussing. Um, but what are some of the key differences? The, the quantum variables on the graph um, in, in loop gravity give the spatial relations. They're not a, a consequence of them. So, um, you know, in lattice gauge theory, you, you would take your space time and you would cut it up into pieces, and it would be the space time that you started with that determined those pieces, how they were related. Here, the, the graph is supposed to be the quantum representation of the thing that gives rise to space time. So you don't want to put any fixed structures on that graph that, uh, that make you think of it as uh, coming from some particular space time. It's the, it's the dynamics of the gravity that's going to determine what the spatial relations and uh, separations and metrical quantities on that graph are. So a very concrete example of this is the lattice spacing in lattice gauge theory. Typically, if you're going to do a lattice gauge theory, you pick how far apart your nodes are. You call it, say, A, the spatial separation of those, and you just fix that and you study on that lattice what your gauge theory does and then maybe later you study what happens when you change that lattice spacing but that would be a background metrical structure if i said how far apart these were then that wouldn't be varying if i fix that it's not dynamical and so in in quantum gravity we can't do that we can't fix that so that's going to cause all sorts of differences with the standard picture of lattice gauge theory okay so uh, in this overview, there was something I had promised you last time and I want to carry through on, which is that I wanted to just give you the last piece of detail about how you construct these holonomies. So they're going to be one of our basic quantum variables and we should know how to build them. So uh, we do it from the Ashtakar connection. And the whole reason to work with holonomies is because of how they behave under gauge transformations. So we're going to try and make that work. Um, so gauge transformations of the connection, well, you get conjugation by the gauge transformation, but you also get this shift factor. Uh, it's like the D lambda that we saw in electromagnetism. Um, the point of exponentiating your connection, exponentiating its integral, is to get rid of this uh, inhomogeneity in the transformation. So uh, when you exponentiate, your holonomy is actually going to transform just by conjugation, and that's a really nice thing. And then the way we were building gauge invariant quantities was we were tracing over that holonomy. When you trace, the cyclic property of the trace makes the G cancel the G inverse, and we just get the trace of the, the core holonomy, which is invariant under the gauge transformation now. Um, so, so the exponentiation is getting rid of the inhomogeneity, but you'll see, and I did it last time, but I didn't explain it last time. That's what I want to explain now. We put this P here also. This P is called path ordering. And the reason that we need it is that we realize that the sort of position variable, the Q variable 
of our theory is a connection, but it's an SU2 connection. And SU2 as a group is non-abelian. The, the matrices in the SU2 part don't commute with each other. And it turns out when you have non-commuting uh, operators, if you try to just naively form their exponential or the exponential of their integral, you're going to get a mess. And the path ordering sorts out that mess. So uh, it's really the path ordering that allows us to keep this nice transformation under gauge. Okay, how does it do it? Well, what you want is you want that these holonomies are a good uh, representation of your group, right? When you exponentiate a Lie algebra element, you're getting a group element. And so, for example, if I compute the holonomy from x1 to x2 along path 1, and then from x2 to x3 along path 2, I want the total holonomy for the total path to break up as a product of the holonomies along the first part with the holonomy along the second part. And for a, an abelian connection, like in electromagnetism, this is just immediate. If you take uh, these two a's to be abelian elements of the Lie algebra, well, you take the exponential of their sum, and it just breaks up as e to the a1 times e to the a2, and you're recovering this nice convolution property. The trouble comes in the non-abelian case, where you've probably encountered in a quantum course the, the so-called uh, Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff uh, result. So if I take the exponential of a, a matrix times the exponential of another matrix, where these two matrices don't commute, then you do not have this nice exponential property we're used to. Uh, BCH says that you get e to the a1 plus a2 plus half their commutator plus a twelfth of their third bracket, etc. So this would just be a mess. If we, if we had to deal with this, we wouldn't have these nice transformation properties at all. So what it is that the path ordering does is get rid of all of these extra terms in the exponentiated object. How does it do that? Well, instead of just taking, remember when you, when you define the exponential of a matrix, the way you define it is, as the identity plus the matrix plus 1 over 2 factorial times the matrix squared, and so on, all the way down the line. Here we just take a less naive definition of the exponential, where we're trying to define this exponential on a path. And so we say it's the identity. Here I'm using this sort of bold-faced I for the identity. It's the identity plus the integral along the path I'm parameterizing the path by s, so s goes 0 to 1 as you go from x to y. You integrate along the path of this connection, and that gives you a well-defined matrix. Fine. But at the next order, you don't put a 1 over 2 factorial. Instead of putting a 1 over 2 factorial, you integrate uh, actually from s1, so from an intermediate step of the path to the endpoint. And then you, after that, integrate from the initial point to the final point. And you do that for the A in this order. And that's the key. It keeps track of the order. And uh, you keep doing this for higher and higher terms. It's always from 0 to 1, then from S1 to 1, and then from um, S2 to 1, and so on. And um, you can prove this result uh, by kind of defining a few properties you want this holonomy to satisfy and figuring out a differential equation, and that's how people usually derive this. But I actually don't think you'll uh, get any intuition for this formula by just going through the proof. Instead, I recommend the following two exercises we'll, that, that'll start to show you that this really is just a generalization of the standard case that you know. So the, the first exercise is to take A to be a constant. If A is constant, you can pull it out of these integrals and just do some of these multiple integrals. And what you'll find is that this triangular integral, this thing where we're kind of integrating over separate sections each way all the way, will give you exactly the 1 over n factorial of the standard exponential uh, expansion that you know and love. So that'll recover kind of part of the story that you know. Uh, but another special case that's nice to try and see how it works is to take s to be variable now, but let it be the constant a1 in the first half of the path, 
and let it be the second constant, a2, in the second half of the past. And again, just compute all these integrals and see what happens. And you'll find that you do indeed recover the non-BCH version, the nice convolution property of the non-abelian case. So that's the goal of this. Once you've convinced yourself of these two things, I do recommend just go to the proof and, and prove it in general, and you'll, you'll fully understand what's going on here. All right. That's the main ingredient that you need to finish defining the Hilbert space. And that's really the goal of this spin network part in my presentation here, is just to understand uh, what is the Hilbert space we're gonna work in in loop quantum gravity. And the cool thing is that by working with holonomies, we've gone to the level of the group. And now you can define a Hilbert space in much closer analogy to the Hilbert spaces you know from standard quantum mechanics. The group comes equipped with a, a measure, an integration measure that people call the Haar measure. So mu here stands for measure, sub H stands for Haar, Haar is spelled this way. And the Hilbert space that we're gonna be working on is the space of square integrable functions of the group elements, uh, square integrable with respect to the Haar measure. So this is just a standard uh, Hilbert space that you now know how to do these sorts of things. Instead of treating position X as your variable, you're gonna treat a group element as your variable, you're gonna integrate against the Haar measure and do all the standard things from quantum mechanics. That's a Hilbert space on one copy of the group. And then the idea is that we're gonna extend this to a Hilbert space over a graph, one of these spin networks. And the graph will have a capital L links. So the, the links are the, just the paths in the graph and capital N nodes, uh, the, the dots in the graph using uh, the standard tensor product. So I'll call the Hilbert space on this graph with L links, L2 of G to the L. G to the L just means uh, the group G tensor producted together L times. And so now we have functions of L group elements, which are just the holonomies along all the links in the graph. Okay, so now you know how to work with a tensor product, uh, sorry, with a Hilbert space over the full graph. And the last ingredient, well, those functions that are functions of the holonomies along each link in the graph, those won't necessarily be gauge invariant. So what we're gonna do is we're finally gonna um, average over the gauge symmetry at each link, that's uh, at each node, excuse me. That's one way of saying it, or you can uh, think of functions that are only gauge invariant at, uh, under gauge transformations at the nodes. That's a sort of symmetry division. So we're dividing by G to the N, and now you have a well-defined Hilbert space on your graph. So that's what the spin network does, is it provides you a basis of loops that you're gonna integrate this connection on, you'll get holonomies, and once you've got that basis, you can build up the Hilbert space in the way that I just described. Okay, to make this nice, to get the uh, inner product and other structures, we need something we call cylindrical consistency of these functions. So, uh, I think this is best illustrated graphically. We need the idea of embedding one graph in another graph. And it's a super simple idea. You just take the graph that you already have and you add in links to get the bigger graph. And the trick is that you put the representation label on all the links that you've added in to zero. And then you're not adding any quantum information. You're not adding any structure to the graph that you've just uh, done. You're just embedding it in the bigger graph. The reason we want that is we want to be able to take inner products between two states, but those states might not live over the same graph. So what do we do? We take gamma and we take gamma prime and we embed them both in a bigger graph. You can always do this, you can show. So you just take a really big graph that includes both of them. And you take the inner product in the Hilbert space that we just described in the, the Hilbert space connected with this bigger graph. Gamma prime prime is the big graph. So this allows a really rich connection to quantum field theory. 
in the limit of considering uh, finer and finer graphs that have more and more and more structure, you can actually define uh, this inner product all the way in the limit, and you get what's called the Ashtakar Lewandowski measure. It's a measure on distributional connections that are distributed over graphs. And uh, you can really think of loop quantum gravity in the continuum in that way. Um, for today, I don't need that. And I'm just going to stick with finite graphs because I think it's a little easier to understand what I'm doing. But it's a beautiful uh, structure and, and well worth your time as you get deeper into these things. OK, so I already said it in words, but let me just make it uh, very concrete. The, a big difference between loop gravity and lattice gauge theory is that the lattice spa spacing of a, your lattice gauge theory represents the metrical distance between the nodes of the lattice. Um, there can't be any fixed structure like that if you're going to have a dynamical background geometry. And so um, building on that idea, I can tell you one more thing that helps you understand why this is so important in the theory. I can't study uh, my lattice gauge, in, in lattice gauge theory, what I can do is I can study it on one lattice spacing, and then I can uh, treat that lattice spacing as a parameter and vary it and see what happens. In loop gravity, that makes no sense. There is no fixed lattice spacing. So how is it that we study what happens as we probe the gravitational field at smaller and smaller distance scales? Well, the idea is that you just work on a bigger and bigger graph. It's very connected with what I was just saying a moment ago about how we take inner products. By embedding the graph that you started with in a bigger graph, and then thinking of this bigger graph as having the boundary data that you initially had on the smaller graph, well, then you can get a refined sense of the degrees of freedom in that region. So it's really the number of nodes in the graph that's controlling how refined your study of the gravitational field is. This starts to get into the topic of renormalization, which is a huge topic and quite uh, actively studied in, in loop gravity. And I, I'll mention it again next week, but uh, I'll stay away from it right now. OK, so uh, the fruit of all of our labors in studying these Ashtakar variables is that we now have a well-defined Hilbert space that we can start to study quantum gravity on. I'm calling it here a kinematical Hilbert space because all that I've done so far is to impose the gauge invariance of the SU2 gauge symmetry. This is the Gauss law. I haven't yet imposed the scalar constraint or the spatial diffeomorphism constraint. I've gotten some of that information by working with spin networks, which uh, make it so that uh, loops that are gauge equivalent are the same. So that actually is taking care of some of the spatial diffeo information. But in particular, I haven't imposed the scalar constraint, which would be like the time evolution of the theory. So that's the sense in which this is only a kinematical Hilbert space. What is that Hilbert space? As we just described, it's described on a fixed graph. You could think of the one on the bottom of the screen here. It's a, a space of square integrable functions uh, over the, the group elements, which are the holonomies along every link of this graph. And then you mod out by gauge invariance. Um, by the way, just to give you an intuitive picture for what this modding out by gauge invariance means, it means that I start at some link, and I use, say, the gauge invariance at the target of that link to fix this link right here to the identity holonomy. That's like a local choice of frame that's saying that there's no uh, parallel transport along that edge. I keep doing that with all the targets along these blackened edges, and I get a network, what we call a spanning tree. It's a tree that visits every node of the graph, but only does so once where I've fixed all the group elements along that spanning tree to the identity. What is this? Well, if you think of the upwards direction as the time direction and the rightwards direction as the spatial direction, it's like I've fixed all of the connection along the time direction to the identity. Do you remember way back two weeks ago, we talked about temporal gauge and electromagnetism? 
where we said that we're going to take the zeroth component of the connection to be zero? Well, that's what we're doing when we do this spanning tree, this particular spanning tree. We're fixing the connection along all the time direction to be trivial. And that means that there's no holonomy in that direction. So this is partly why I was mentioning temporal gauge way back. People were asking, why are you talking about temporal gauge? And this is because it's a nice intuitive picture of a gauge fixing in our lattice. Again, don't get confused about the fact that I'm drawing a square lattice here. It's just for convenience. You could draw a more complicated lattice. Um, OK, what are the, the wave functions of our theory? Well, they're the functions that are cylindrical on uh, our connection, right? So these are, in particular, functionals of the connection that we integrate to get our holonomies. And we talk about wave functions that are gauge invariant. So these are gauge invariant functions of these holonomies. And what does it mean physically? Well, the holonomies probe the space-time curvature. So if I took a little plaquette here and I went around that plaquette, I would be probing how much curvature I got on parallel transport going around that plaquette. Um, Meanwhile, we also introduced the, the flux operators, and the fluxes probe the areas that are the uh, transverse surfaces between two nodes in the graph. Um, and uh, the nodes themselves are labeled by intertwiners, which give, as the example I keep using is volume, so they give an, a metrical measure of the extent of that region. So this is the Hilbert space that we study in loop gravity. And I presented it to you in this canonical framework. So you're to think of these uh, spin network graphs as uh, spatial. And then we're, we would study from here the time evolution of that spatial graph. Um, that's been pursued a lot in this canonical framework where you use a Hamiltonian analysis and you try to understand what the scalar constraint does in time as you evolve a spin network. I'm going to shift gears, though, today and stop working in the Hamiltonian framework, and I'm going to transition over to a path integral. It's for the reasons I already mentioned at the beginning. I want to give you uh, some geometrical insights into time evolution, and uh, I'm going to be able to do that more directly through the path integral. But both uh, sides, time evolution in the Hamiltonian framework and the path integral spin foam formalism are actively pursued and uh, and both have really interesting and complementary results. So I, re I recommend thinking about both sides of that. All right, how am I doing time-wise? All right, we are, it's probably a good time to stop and see if there are questions from that first section. Yes, there are three, uh, three questions in the Q&A. Okay, They're great. Different. So Deepan says, uh, what would be a good measure of Ricci curvature for the discrete fuzzy geometry? Good, Deepan. So uh, the, we've actually kind of gotten to that question now. Let me see if I can go back here. Uh, it's, it's closely related to what I was just saying. So let me sort out a, a small piece of confusion. Um, Ricci curvature measures the intrinsic curvature of the geometry. So when we talk about the tetrahedral system, that uh, is just a single grain of our space, and it doesn't have any 3D curvature, right? What we, I said it was an interpolation that we imagined had a flat metric on the inside, so the Ricci curvature is zero. Um, <clears throat> you might have been thinking about the surface area of the tetrahedron, and the, when we embedded this tetrahedron in 3D, we see that there's uh, an extrinsic curvature as I go from one face of the tetrahedron to the next. Uh, so you would probe that with the, the extrinsic curvature. Uh, nonetheless, your point is exactly right that we do want eventually to probe Ricci curvature because that's going to be about uh, the full GR. And the way that we probe that Ricci curvature is through these loop holonomies we were just discussing. So they don't involve just one tetrahedron, but if you imagined a tetrahedron at each of these nodes, and those tetrahedra were glued together, what we would do is we would calculate the holonomy as we went from one of the tetrahedra to the next, all the way around in a loop, and that would be the probe of the Ricci curvature that we're getting. So it's these H variables 
these holonomies that are capturing the Ricci curvature. All right, Faikal asks, uh, do you mean that whatever polyhedra we might choose, they must have the volume and fluxes uh, spectra with their minimas? Okay, uh, good question. Um, it's a bit of a subtle point that you're starting to get at. Um, when we study this uh, in loop gravity, as I've been mentioning, we always tend to fix the graph. I'm wondering, uh, I'll use this picture down here. So when I fix the graph, uh, its nodes have a, a particular valency. So um, the reason I wasn't totally happy with this picture is that each of these nodes is three valent, and I wanted a four valent node so that I could talk about a tetrahedron. So imagine for a moment that at this node that I'm pointing to right now, there was a fourth link coming out. Then that would represent a tetrahedron. Why? Well, because there would be four fluxes, and those four fluxes, well, their internal I index, the little I index, would tell their direction in internal space. So these would represent four directions in internal space. The fact that they meet at a node means they would sum up to zero, and we would get a tetrahedron here. Um, if I went then to a neighboring node, and that node was five valent, well, then I would have five fluxes that added up to zero. Those five fluxes would represent a pentahedron. It would be like a tetrahedron, but with a fifth face. You can picture a pentahedron by taking your tetrahedron and just cutting off a tip. And you'll be left with something with five faces. So in this interpolation scheme that I've been using, you would, um, you would be picking up uh, polyhedra of the same number of faces as the valence of the node. That affects the spectrum of the volume. So uh, it's not quite true what you said. It's not that they all have the same uh, spectra. The tetrahedra would have spectra, volume spectra that depended on the areas at the, uh, that meet at that node. And the pentahedron would have a completely different spectrum, and so on and so forth. So this is actually something that you have to study when you pick your intertwiner. If you're going to use volume as an intertwiner, you need to study it. And in particular, at a five valent node, you're going to need more than one intertwiner label. And so sometimes at that point, we switch from using volume to using dihedral angles between faces because it's a little easier. So I'm giving you a quick answer. There's lots of details there uh, and, and much to think about. Michael also asks about whether path ordering seems exactly like the time ordering in quantum field theory where S is a time parameter. Yeah, it's a good comparison. Um, the, the path ordering is ordering you as you go along that path. So if that's a path in time, that would be a time ordering. Um, but the point is here that it's, you can do it with an auxiliary parameter. It doesn't have to have any physical meaning. Um, it's the, the metrical variables themselves that will carry the physical meaning, the, the connection in this case. Yeah. Uh, would you like to take a, a one raised hand first? I think. Yes, um, please. Was, um, raising his hand for quite a while. Yeah, please, please. Um, yeah, you can uh, mute yourself, Alfred. Can you speak up again? I I don't. Unfortunately, we can't hear you well. You might have to put your your question in the chat. You try one more time, but we weren't getting good audio. So it means I am audible. I want to ask that uh, what I mean, suppose we are dis we are writing the full space time in terms of a in terms of tetrahedra. Huh? So what will be the correspondence in uh, correspondence or fluctuation there? If you are fixing the lengths of the tetrahedra, so what will be the fluctuations there? Good, I understand. Um, so uh, be careful. This is the warning I was giving you at the outset. I don't want you to get too attached to thinking of uh, fixing tetrahedra. All we're doing is fixing some of the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. And in particular, as we mentioned, when we mentioned this fuzziness right up here, 
we're not fixing all the lengths of the tetrahedron. We can't. There is no quantum state that does that. That would be a classical state. The quantum state fixes only five of the six parameters. And so this state itself has fluctuations. And those fluctuations permeate through the whole network. And as such, you get fluctuations of the metric itself. So, um, so don't get too attached to thinking of this classical picture. The classical picture is to build your intuition towards thinking about this quantum fuzzy picture. Uh, that's a, that that's a god means what? But the length is are fixed. Yeah, means the space time, full space time is not made up of only one tetra. There are number of tetra. If you fluctuate one, you have to fluctuate the length is so that full space time will fluctuate. Otherwise, yes. means making fluctuation only one tetrahedra, there will be no fluctuation flow in the space time. Only one is means uh, what is it fluctuating on its place. That is not possible. Agreed. That's absolutely correct. The fluctuation spread through the whole network. That's correct. Good. Uh, Idris has a question. In this temporal gauge, how do we treat the curvature component of scalars as the space has a discrete structure while time is continuous? Um, good. Uh, so Idris, I was um, being a little bit probably too sloppy when I was talking about this time gauge. I was just trying to give you an intuition for what one example of the gauge fixing would be. I haven't actually sp specified for you how to do time evolution in this Hamiltonian framework. And so I haven't actually told you how you can carry information of the spin network at one slice to information at the next slice. <laughs> And, uh, and so I haven't told you how to get the kind of components of the curvature that you're asking about. Um, so, so yeah, we, we definitely need to add more structure on top of this. Um, and that's partly why I'm going to go towards this spin foam formalism. And I'll take one more question. So Deepan says, uh, are the nodes related to the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients? Um, that's absolutely correct, Deepan, um, and I was sort of avoiding it because it's a big topic, but it's actually quite beautiful because it connects with, again, your uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics. So these intertwiners that I've been mentioning, I've been labeling them just with this I label, and I haven't been unpacking the details of them. Sorry, I'm scanning past where I want to show you. So this I label here. Um, you can think of it as a combination of Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. So it's as if I first coupled angular momentum one to angular momentum two to get an intermediate angular momentum, call it J12, and then I couple that to three and four to get zero. Uh, it turns out coupling to get zero is unique, so I don't have to do another intermediate one. And so this intertwiner label, one way to think of it is that it's a, a sequence of two Klebsch-Gordon coefficients that have been combined in a nice way. That nice way of combining them has been studied for years in the context of atomic theory and angular momenta, and they're called uh, Wigner symbols, uh, the Wigner 3NJ symbols. So um, this is an example of what's called a 6J symbol, it turns out. Uh, so it's a it's a slight generalization of a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient, but it's you're right on the right track, um, and there's lots of beautiful literature on this, including Wigner's uh, initial work. All right, so let's uh, continue on from there. All right. So I wanted to, um, to explain one more feature of the tetrahedron. Unfortunately, it was coming up in the questions just now anyway. Uh, it's about this fuzziness. Uh, I've, I, I've been saying it in that language, which is a little bit imprecise. And uh, I think it may help some of you if I try to make it a little bit more concrete and precise. Um, before I do that, I'm going to make a change in notation. I'm sorry, as a teacher, I usually try to avoid such things, uh, but it's a bit inevitable here that uh, there's an overload on notation. There's just too many things that we need to keep track of. 
And um, for the first half of this course, I've been uh, fastidious about always using E when I talked about the flux variables. This, of course, highlights the analogy with electromagnetism, and I think it's really nice for emphasizing that this closure relation is closely related to Gauss's law. But at this point, I want to transition to putting more emphasis on the geometry, and so I'm going to change notation to, uh, to highlight that emphasis. So what I was calling E's up to now, these electric flux vectors, I'm going to start calling them A's to highlight the fact that their magnitudes represent the area of the tetrahedral face, and their directions are just the normal to the face. Um, so it's just a pure change of notation. I'm going anytime I wrote E before, I'll call it A. Why didn't I do this from the beginning? Well, in the beginning, we were calling the Ashtakar connection A, and we've been calling connections, gauge, gauge connections A throughout, and so I didn't want to confuse those two things. But fortunately, for the, the next part of the, the discussion, I don't need to refer to the Ashtakar connection as much. If I want to talk about holonomies, I can just talk about holonomies directly and not refer to the connection underneath them. So, uh, so that's going to remove the overburdening of the letter A, and A will now refer to areas in the, in the rest. One of the reasons I'm making this change, aside from convenience for the rest of the talk, is that the literature has both conventions in it, and I, I just actually want to expose you to both conventions so you're not confused as you're reading the literature. Um, a little bit more notation that I'll add in. Um, I, I need to label the pieces of the tetrahedron quite often in what follows. So I'm going to label edges of the tetrahedron by lowercase e's. I'm going to label triangles of the tetrahedron by t's. And I'm going to label the tetrahedron as a whole by the Greek letter tau. And so this is going to allow me to kind of talk about the pieces as we're going through. All right, so that's the change in notation. Uh, I do apologize if it causes any confusion. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm happy to kind of field questions about it. OK, so something that's really cool about this CAT system, this tetrahedron system that we've been talking so much about is that it works just as well for uh, Lorentzian geometries as it worked for Euclidean geometries. So we can have time-like cats as well as space-like cats, which is really surprising and interesting. Um, the, the closure relation, as I've been calling it, the sum over the triangles of the flux through the triangles uh, is still zero. It works exactly the same way in the Lorentzian case. And I want to do some of this uh, parameter counting that people in the questions have been asking about, because it's important. So uh, as we were saying, the number of parameters, if you're taking an edge length perspective, is just six. There are six edge lengths in a tetrahedron. Um, the area vectors, or these flux vectors, they have, there's four of them, and each one of them is a vector in uh, internal three space. And so they have 12 components. So it's pretty clear that the area vectors are way overkill. We have twice as many variables as we need to actually describe the tetrahedron. And we know why that is. We know that they're actually gauge variables. They should be redundant. They should overcount things. So um, we could try, well, let's just restrict to the magnitudes of these vectors and only study that. But the trouble is there's only four area magnitudes. And so now we've got too few they're gauge invariant, but they're too few. <laughs> so we're, we need the sweet spot of six variables. And so as I was mentioning, both in the context of these Klebsch-Gordon coefficients and in the context of higher valent nodes, it's very convenient to introduce an additional variables. And they're simply defined. They're just the dot products between the area vector at triangle T and the area vector at triangle T prime. Um, there's one more facet, uh, which is that if I'm dealing with Euclidean and Lorentzian geometries, it turns out that the, the volume squared will have a plus or a minus sign, plus for Euclidean and minus for Lorentzian. This is a lot like the space-like and time-like intervals that you're used to. So it's very convenient in what and moving forward when we calculate these dot products to always put the sign of the the tetrahedron in front. It's just going to make all the formulas work really well. Okay, 
So um, it turns out that there are exactly six independent variables amongst these dot products. And the reason is really cool. The reason is because uh, if we take the closure and uh, dot product any one of the triangle area vectors into that closure, I'm going to get a relationship amongst all the dot products. So they provide four constraints on these variables. And we can do something really cool now. So what we can do, we started out with 16 dot products, right? There are four faces, and we're going to dot product with another face. So that's four times four is 16 variables. We have the closure, which we, we know means that there's a symmetry of rotation. You would think that symmetry only re, uh, removes um, three variables, but it's the usual story with a symmetry. The constraint surface itself, the sum of the j's equals zero, puts three constraints, and the symmetry puts three more. So you subtract six from symmetry, and then we have these four relations that we get from dot producting into the, the constraints, and uh, we reduce these 16 dot products down to six variables. It's exactly the number we need. So in the cat language, these are the shape space variables. We've gone from orientation variables, the full set of all components of the A's, down to the shape space coordinates, the six variables. Um, just to be concrete, uh, I'm going to pick four of the six variables to be the four face areas, the magnitude squared of the face area. And the remaining two, I'm going to choose to be dot products around uh, uh, edges. So it's going to be the, the dot product along e, uh, around edge E1 of the face, the two faces that adjoin on that edge. And I'm going to do that for two edges that are not opposite in the tetrahedron. This is a really surprising bit of classical geometry that you should go and try yourself. If you use opposite edges in the tetrahedron, it turns out it doesn't specify the tetrahedron. That's a surprise to me at first. But as long as you use non-opposite edges, these two dot products will be independent, and I'll have a complete set of shape space variables. All right. So I'm giving you this richer, detailed treatment of the tetrahedron to really put emphasis on one point. It's that these area vectors we already noticed had the commutation relations of an angular momenta. They be behave like angular momenta. So uh, in particular, if I compute the Poisson bracket of one component of an area vector with another, I just get the structure constants of the relevant group. Turns out the relevant group depends on whether I'm talking about a Euclidean tetrahedron, in which case it's SO3, or a Lorentzian one, in which case it's SO2, one. But as long as I contract the epsilon symbol with the correct metric, the correct metric for that signature uh, in the internal space, then these uh, always have this commutation relation. So uh, I can reframe this more geometrically in terms of these dot product variables we were just talking about. If you compute the two dot product variables, you just go through the whole calculation, and beautifully you get exactly plus or minus the volume squared. So this was this insight that we had already when we first introduced the tetrahedron. But the emphasis that I want to put on it now is that means that in the description of our system, we're working with variables that do not Poisson commute. That's going to be hugely relevant for everything that follows. Even in this incredibly simplified context of just these few finite degrees of freedom of the gravitational field, already our variables don't commute. In fact, one of the ways that this is the, the precise comment, the precise version of the comment that the tetrahedron is, is fuzzy, right? When X and P don't commute, you can't measure them simultaneously. So if some of the variables that describe my tetrahedron don't commute, I can't measure them arbitrarily precisely at the same time. So this is a key feature of our quantum tetrahedra, and it's going to show up in every aspect of the theory. So I was uh, jokingly, again, phrasing this in terms of the cat. We're going to see the cat puts its paw prints everywhere.
that is the the non-commutation of these variables means that we just can't get away from the fact that we are dealing with a, a quantum mechanical system at the heart here that is non-commuting all right so again i'm just putting emphasis on something that you've already seen but that emphasis is going to help us to understand why the path integral takes the form that it does so let's dive into the path integral so the idea of doing a geometrical path integral for quantum gravity has been around since the beginning of quantum gravity. It's really a compelling idea. So the idea is to, I, I'm going down one dimension just so we can look at things. The idea is to kind of pick a region, say this disk shaped region, fix the metric on the boundary of that region, and then try to integrate over all geometries that interpolate that boundary. By doing that path integral, we should be able to get an amplitude associated with that boundary, and then we can talk about, okay, what does it mean to transition from one, uh, one metric, say uh, the metric on part of the boundary, to another metric, uh, the metric on the other part of the boundary. Um, unfortunately, every approach to this has run into problems. <laughs> so uh, there's just a, an immense number of tricky aspects of doing this path integral. So you have to choose a set of variables to integrate over. Uh, you have to uh, figure out how to be sure that you're integrating over all the geometries on the interior that are distinct geometries. That is, how do we describe different metrical geometries? The, this is the, the downside of diffeomorphism invariance, right? If we're going to try to do this path integral, we have a huge gauge group to try to deal with and quotient out by. And uh, of course, in a path integral formulation, you'd love to be able to sort of go from one uh, finite region to the next finite region and integrate over both and uh, integrate out the intermediate step. So you'd like to compose regions to form bigger and bigger regions. And this is also quite a challenge. So um, I don't know of a, a beautiful, physically compelling answer to all of the questions I was just posing for you. There's no, um, there's no version of the beautiful axioms of special relativity for the gravitational path integral. We don't have a principle that picks out uh, exactly the right variables to use over exactly which geometries and uh, uh, that will give correct physical predictions. But I'm going to use a sort of motivation taken from Feynman's beautiful picture of the path integral. Remember when, when Feynman first introduces it, he thinks of this uh, multi-slit screen. And he thinks of the sort of composing these very simple paths, which are just straight line paths up to the slit and going over to your next thing, and another one, and, and summing over all of those. So what I'm going to do is go to a space time where I do that same thing. And this is the piecewise linear interpolation I was just mentioning to you. So how am I going to, let, let me give you the example of two-dimensional geometries as the first case, because it's easiest to see. How am I going to study a 2D surface? Well, I'm going to take that surface and I'm going to break it up into pieces. I'm going to think of each one of those pieces as a flat Euclidean triangle. And then I'm going to glue those triangles together. Well, if I glued all the way around this vertex here in the middle, I would just get a flat surface by forced to, right? Because I used Euclidean triangles, I would get a Euclidean uh, flat surface. However, if I leave out one of the triangles and glue along the two edges that I left out this triangle for, well, then I can get a curved surface. You can see it at right, or at least I've tried to picture it. Here I'm using embedding again as a way to see it. You can see that this surface is now got a con conical tip at it. The beautiful thing is that even though I'm using embedding for you to look at this picture, parallel transport still gives you the fact that this has intrinsic curvature. If you take a little vector tangent to one of these triangles and you parallel transport it around this pink node, you'll find that it does not transport back to itself. And so even an ant that lives on this surface would measure the fact that there's intrinsic curvature here. So the idea is I'm going to try to do the path integral a la Feynman slits. I'm going to try to give this piecewise linear interpolation. Why? Well, 
the piecewise linear interpolation does this really nice thing, which is that uh, the action, when you discretize it that way, well, it breaks up into these really nice pieces where you just get a kinetic term that's the discretization of the usual kinetic term and the potential at each point. And this is just a sum. The action is just adding up those finite approximations. And that additive factorization of the action means that the path integral almost factorizes into a product. It just becomes a product of these. Uh, except for one thing, which is that when I have one linear piece matching the next linear piece, I have to glue at this point. And that gluing, well, it's the fact that xk shows up both in the term with xk minus 1 in it and in the term with xk plus 1 in it. And so those I have to identify as variables, and that's the only thing that stops us from this nice factorization. And there's a nice way to think about this. You can actually get that nice factorization. How? By just adding in another variable. By adding in an intermediate piece in this stretch, I, I can split this piece into two pieces. Uh, it's not for free. I now have another variable in my path integral that I have to deal with. But it's really interesting that this is kind of the structure of how this path integral works. Okay, the reason I'm saying all of these things is I'm going to try and build up the gravitational path integral in very close an analogy to this. I also have to tell you what variables I'm going to choose. And uh, here I'm really motivated by the thoughts I gave you in the first lecture, by this theme that we've seen in the Ashtakar variables that somehow four-dimensional gravity, the most natural variables sitting around are areas. So I'm going to work with area variables. And, um, and it's going to kind of take me through a slightly convoluted path that I think might be a little surprising to all of you. If I use area variables in my discrete gravity theory, it turns out that I can have no curvature. <laughs> my Reggie calculus has flat solutions. And so you might think, uh-oh, that's just a dead theory. Well, it turns out that it's not if you constrain the theory. So if I take my classical theory and I add constraints in, then um, as long as I add those constraints in the right way, uh, then there's a non-trivial curvature in my solutions. And I'll try to explain how that happens and why that happens. Um, the right way means imposing them weakly. So I'm only going to impose them uh, essentially in expectation value. I'm not going to impose them that you have to always satisfy my constraints. It's only that you have to satisfy them in expectation value. And that's going to be the way to kind of navigate between this flatness and, uh, and a totally unruly theory that would include things that we don't want in gravity. Um, and in particular, I'll show you that the, the weak imposition of the constraints allows me uh, to combine the model parameters in a way that you can actually get nice classical geometries out of your theory. Uh, there's this, what I'm saying is there's a semi-classical limit to, to this path integral. So uh, I already mentioned this at the beginning, but I'm going to tell you about only one version of this spin foam. It's called an effective spin foam. Um, and uh, it's one that I've worked on. That's partly why I'm telling you about it. Uh, but it's also extremely computationally efficient. So if you want to start to get your mind around what, how a path integral works, this uh, uh, loop gravity style path integral, this uh, is a very useful model to start playing with because you can really put it on a com your own laptop and do computations. The EPRO model has some beautiful numerical work done by uh, Sarno and Dona and many people. And um, uh, those, are, however, are high performance computing models. You have to really start to use uh, high powered computing to get uh, results out of those models. Uh, again, part of my goal is to give you a complementary introduction to spin foams than are uh, many of those that are already out there. And one of the beautiful reviews on the subject is by Alejandro Perez, and you can see it in this living review. Okay, 
So uh, I've tried to give you context for the way in which I'm going to study this path integral. And uh, to actually give you some of the details, I need to introduce you to this approach to just standard classical gravity uh, due to Tullio Reggi, and it's called Reggi Calculus. Um, and as I was motivating, uh, it, the idea is we're going to take our space time and cut it up into simplices. So if we were studying a two dimensional surface, we would cut that surface up into triangles and that's roughly what this picture on the right shows. If we were studying a three dimensional space, we would cut it up into tetrahedra, we would glue those tetrahedra together and, uh, and that, study that model. In a four-dimensional space-time, we're going to cut space-time up into the higher dimensional analog of a tetrahedron. It's called a four-simplex, and we're going to glue four simplices together and study them. This is very hard to visualize. Uh, most of us can't even visualize a four-simplex, let alone gluing four simplices into a space-time. So I'm going to try to build up to that by looking at the triangulations in lower dimensions and trying to give you some intuition. So uh, as I already explained, I think it's pretty visually clear that if you leave out one of the triangles of a 2D triangulation, when you glue the edges, you get a curvature at the tip of this cone. That is intrinsic curvature. Of course, there's the embedded curvature going from one triangle to the next, um, but that's, we know that's not something that you want to think about initially because we're not thinking of our space time as being embedded in a bigger space. So we call these vertices uh, in the in the two dimensional case, uh, we call them bones because they're the places at which curvature is concentrated. And the first theme that is going to emerge here is that the bones of any triangulation are always two dimensions lower than the simplices that you're using. So in this surface case, we were using two dimensional triangles and the curvature is concentrated at zero dimensional points. In other words, bones that have our vertices. We can see this also in tetrahedra. So how are we gonna build a triangulation of a 3D space time? Well, you could imagine taking an orange and cutting that orange up into orange slices. Those are gonna be our tetrahedra. And if we glued all the orange slices back together, we'd get the full orange. But if I removed one of the orange slices and threw it away and glued what was left over, I would concentrate curvature, not now on a vertex, but on this red line that goes from tip to tip here. I've caused a defect in the curvature there. How would you measure that defect? You would parallel transport in the around a little loop that surrounds that red uh, line. And uh, you would see that the, the vector you were trying to parallel transport was rotated when you came back to where you started. And hence this uh, bone, this line here carries curvature. Um, in 3D, there's an intriguing uh, alignment that you can use. We're used to describing metrical geometry by edge lengths. And this bone is one dimensional, so you can also think of it as having an edge length. And uh, this uh, angle, this curvature angle that we measure in going around the bone, well, those two things turn out in 3D to be automatically symplectically conjugate. If you calculate the Poisson bracket between one of them and the other, you automatically get the standard Poisson relations. So in 3D, you can kind of use standard metric quantization and it, it actually works pretty well. Um, so that's an intriguing thing that happens in 3D that turns out to fail in 4D. So let me try to give you the picture of 4D. Here, things get really hard to visualize, <laughs> but uh, we can try to understand what's going on. Uh, so the theme has been that bones are two dimensions down. So the bones, the places where curvature is concentrated in 4D should be triangles. How do I think about that? Well, what is a four simplex? A four simplex is just five vertices in a, your four dimensional space that are all connected to each other. So you could take, for example, the vertices zero, one, two, three, and four. And uh, you could think about them. Uh, let's see, 
sorry, I misspoke. Let me let me do that again because it's going to be better if I get it right. Um, I could take the vertices. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm thinking about this, I want to include this pink triangle in both of the simplices that I describe, <laughs> and so that's what I'm thinking about. Uh, but what I built here is a simplicial complex. You see, it has more than five vertices. It's got six vertices. So this must represent the gluing of two four simplices one to the other. Uh, and that gluing happens through a tetrahedron. And, uh, and so you can see that, uh, for example, the four simplex 0, 4, 1, 3, and 5, and the four simplex 0, 1, 3, 5, and 2, they both share the vertices 0, 1, 3, and 5. That's the tetrahedron that they're glued along. That's the way to think about it. Um, now, if I try to do a parallel transport, I can do that in the four-dimensional space going around the triangle. And that's how the, the curvature gets concentrated on the pink triangle that I've drawn here. So uh, it's really a higher dimensional analog of this orange slice story I just told you. But here we have a choice that's a much harder choice than we had in lower dimensions. If we want to work with the standard metrical length variables, then it turns out the symplectically conjugate variable is a complicated combination of things. It's got lengths and angles in it in a way that's very hard to work with. So we maybe want to get rid of lengths. And it turns out the curvature angle, the natural thing associated with this holonomy that we were just mentioning, is the, the conjugate area, the area of the triangle that we went around. So that's going to be one of the motivations, again, to work with area variables. OK, so this is very harmonious with everything we've said about loop quantum gravity. So let me tell you a, a new version of Regi calculus. It's not just using edge lengths, but using what we call area Regi calculus. All right. So we can just count things. We said that a four simplex has five vertices. Out of those five vertices, to pick an edge, we just pick two of them. So five choose two gives us 10 edges. And in an interesting uh, matchup, you can also calculate five choose three and you get 10 triangles as well. Five choose four on the other hand gives you uh, five tetrahedra. So a way to think about those five tetrahedra is you uh, drop any one of the vertices of the four simplex and you've got a tetrahedron. You do that for all five of the vertices and you've got five tetrahedra. They're all glued together to give you the four simplex. If you pick out any triangle, say this one that's in pink here again, the, it's the one that's specified by the three orange vertices in the picture, you can compute the area of that triangle using its edge lengths. This is a famous formula in classical geometry. It's called Heron's formula. In case you've never seen it before, I've just listed it at the bottom of the page. Uh, it says that the area of the triangle squared is equal to this product of the edge lengths. It's a beautiful little result. Now, we, we just counted all the variables, and there's something quite interesting here. There's a match. There's 10 edges and 10 triangles. That means in my tetrahedron, there's exactly 10 edge lengths and 10 areas. So you can actually invert. We have this formula for the area as a function of the edge lengths. We can write down that formula for all 10 areas, and we can try to solve that system of polynomials to give the edge lengths as functions of the areas. This is a strange thing to do at first, but you see that what it's doing is making the lengths the quantities that you derive, that you get from the given areas. Um, it turns out that uh, when it's a polynomial system like this, you might have a discrete set of roots, but the counting we just did is enough to ass assure you that you don't have more than a discrete set of roots. So this is doable. Um, we're also going to work with these dihedral angles that we mentioned. So if I pick out any tetrahedron, say the one picked out by the four orange vertices in this picture, in that tetrahedron, I can compute the dot product between two of its area vectors, and I can get the 3D dihedral angle. 
So this is going to be another uh, thing that's of interest to us. In particular, what it's going to do for us is that uh, if you specify this 3D dihedral angle, you'll be able to separate out which of the roots you're talking about. Okay. So what's the idea of the Regi calculus? The Regi calculus is uh, built out of this discretization of general relativity. We take the Einstein-Hilbert action and we try to write that action, uh, which you know is the integral over d4x of the metrical determinant times the Ricci, the Ricci scalar. We try to write that in terms of the discrete variables of the simplices. And it turns out it breaks down into two really simple, nice components under this discretization. It's called the Regi action, and it's simply the area of the triangles times the curvature of the triangles. What do I mean by the curvature? Well, I mean the same thing that we were just doing in all of those lower dimensional pictures. I imagine going around that triangle and gluing tetrahedra on one by one, and um, I compute the dihedral angle between each of those, and I take 2 pi minus that. And that'll be the difference between how much you get in going around that from 2 pi, well, that deficit would tell you whether you're flat or not. If the sum of these angles was 2 pi, this would be 0, and you'd have no curvature. But if the sum of those angles were different from 2 pi, you'd either have an excess of angles, in which case you'd be um, curved in one direction. Uh, like, a, let's see, the excess is going to be like the spherical case, I think. And then if you uh, had too little angle as you went around that bone, you'd be recovering the hyperbolic case. I may have those two mixed. I should think about it. Um, OK. So in the standard length Regi calculus, what you would do is you'd think of these areas as functions of the given metrical lengths. You'd think of these dihedral angles as the um, as also functions of those metrical lengths, and you'd calculate the variation of this action with respect to lengths. And since we're working with a discrete set of variables, the variation boils down to this very simple uh, differential equation. This is a sum over all edges contained in a particular uh, triangle. And, uh, and it's a beautiful result that Reggie showed and people following Reggie uh, did more carefully that this does, as you make the, trying, the discretization finer and finer, this does recover the Einstein equation. All right, so that's the idea of standard Regi calculus, but we want to do this alternative. We want to do area Regi calculus. So how do we do that? Well, it's a little convoluted, but it's also quite simple in another way. <laughs> Remember, the Regi action was areas times deficit angles. And we just express them both in terms of what we were thinking of as the fundamental variables. So we're going to try and take that exact same action and express it in terms of areas instead of edge lengths. So how do we do that? Well, the area already is in terms of areas. So we're just going to treat that part of the action as part of our variables. We're going to take AT as one of our variables. And then we're going to use this inversion we just did. We're going to use the fact that we can trade uh, the areas as functions of length, for lengths as functions of area, and we're going to use those lengths computed from the areas in our formula for the deficit angles, that is the dihedral angles. We can compute each one as a function of the areas by writing it as a function of edge lengths written in terms of areas. And now we have the Regi action in what we call area Regi calculus. And now the whole action is just a function of area variables. So what do we do? We again compute the equation of motion. And when you compute the equation of motion, we're varying the areas this time instead of the edge lengths. So when you vary AT, you just get the deficit angle. When you vary the epsilon, you get the sum of AT times the variation of the epsilon. And there's a famous formula. It's called the Schlafly identity. 
I'm not going to try and prove it for you right now because it goes a little bit too much into details. But the Schlafly identity guarantees that this sum, the sum of areas uh, of a four simplex times the change in the dihedral angles under a small change in the areas, uh, that this sum always vanishes. That's the content of the Schlafly identity. So this is where we get our problem. The variation of the Regi, area Regi action has reduced to a single deficit. That deficit vanishing just imposes flatness, it says that your whole triangulation has to be flat. So that's a bummer. <laughs> It looks like we're stuck at the beginning. We can't do this discretization of general relativity working with area variables. That's how it appears. It turns out that there's a way out. And uh, the way out is to impose constraints on the theory. And this is a, a really interesting feature. And this is the place where we first see the, the paw print of the cat coming back. Um, why did this happen? Why did length area length regi calculus have good equations of motion and area regi calculus didn't? You can check it just by the number of degrees of freedom. Gluing along the, the tetrahedron with the orange vertices, so here's one simplex and I'm going to glue it to this other four simplex along the orange vertices, we see that we can match up six edge lengths, but only four areas get matched up. And that means that there's more freedom in the area uh, description. In particular, we can capture exactly what that additional freedom is. We're trying to glue these two four simplices through a tetrahedron. So the mismatch can be resolved by introducing the dot product variables we were discussing earlier. In particular, let's let uh, the following function, p, at an edge in a tetrahedron tau in a simplex sigma as a function of area, be the dihedral angle in, along the edge E in the tetrahedron tau given as a function of the areas. So that's just a way of specifying what the dihedral angle at this edge should be. And in particular, we can make sure that these shape match, that is, we can make sure the two tetrahedra we're gluing are really of the same geometry if we make sure that these dihedral angles agree as well, right? Glue the areas and the dihedral angles. These are the additional constraints that we need for the theory in area variables to really behave like the theory in length variables. Okay, this leads to a complicated system. It's highly non-local, um, so that's kind of annoying. If I really think of these dihedral angles as functions of the areas, I have to know all the areas in this simplex and all the areas in this simplex in order to even write down the constraint, and that means that the constraint is relating pieces of space-time that are separated one from another. We don't want that kind of non-locality. It makes our theory really hard to work with. So uh, what we're going to do is go back to this idea we saw in the one-dimensional quantum mechanics path integral. You remember we noticed that if we introduce this intermediate variable, we could couple these. So we're going to do that. We're going to work in a generalization of uh, area regi calculus. We can discuss the constraints if uh, we introduce a new variable into the theory. The variable is the dihedral angle itself, right? That was the, the intuition we got from the tetrahedral picture. And the constraint we're going to impose is calculate the dihedral angle only in its tetrahedron, and then impose that that uh, is the correct dihedral angle as computed by the areas separately in the in the different simplices. The advantage of these localized constraints is that they preserve this additive factorization of the action. So this is where we're going to be able to build a path integral structure. OK. Final technical point, and then we're actually at the heart of the thing. Uh, importantly, we saw that the, the cat's paw print, right? the fact that these dihedral angle variables didn't commute. 
but we're trying to use those variables to impose constraints. So that means our constraints aren't going to compute, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me com commute with one another. So uh, what do we call these? We call these second class constraints. These are constraints that don't commute. And uh, that's going to be important. The fact that they don't commute means that uh, we can't impose them strongly. So that's what I'm going to tell you about uh, moving forward. But before I move to that, let me just show you that this is starting to make sense. All right. How do we get deficit angles? Well, we do it by adding over all the simplices that meet at a triangle, dihedral angles in those simplices, and we compute 2 pi minus that difference. We then uh, can write out the area Reggie action as follows. You can write it as a split. There's the part that comes from the 2 pi that uh, becomes this first piece. And there's the part that comes with the dihedral angles that becomes the second piece. And, um, and we can write each of those as local functions. So the first uh, action integral we think of as um, uh, based at triangles, and the second action functional is based at four simplices. OK. Uh, so what is this NT? Uh, NT is a little index. You, you would have complained, Hal, wait, you said there was a 2 pi here, but then suddenly where'd the 2 go? Um, the point is that triangles that are on the boundary of your discretization behave a little bit differently than triangles that are in the bulk. When they're in the boundary, you only want a factor of pi, not a factor of 2 pi. So this index just takes into account the fact that the triangle is either on the boundary or in the bulk, and puts a 2 there if it's in the bulk, and it puts a 1 there if it's in the boundary. All right. So how do we get our total action? We build up these pieces we were just looking at, the tri triangle contribution, the simplex contribution, uh, but we also have the constraints. The constraints are going to be the gluing requirements the, the, that require these dihedral angles to agree. OK, now we can finally do our path integral. We can bring in the quantization piece. Remember what we learned from everything we'd done up to now was that loop quantum gravity gives you a discretization of the areas. So that means that we actually, anywhere there's an area in here, we can write it in terms of the spectral parameter j, right? And we can think, I'm so sorry, I've got a, oh no, I don't have a typo, it's fine. Um, good. Uh, so uh, if you like, if you're studying this thing in the large j limit, you can do a uh, Taylor expansion and only deal with the first term in the Taylor expansion. It just simplifies uh, looking at the spectrum. OK, so let me try to make a little bit more explicit what this weak constraint stuff does for you. You notice these quantum values of the area, their discrete set of values, right? I can have one half a Planck length. I can have one and a half Planck lengths. I can have one Planck length. Uh, sorry, Planck, there, Planck area, I meant every time there. All of those uh, values, well, they're discrete, right? And so I don't have, how many tetrahedra do I have with a given set of areas? It's going to be very few. They have to have very particular dihedral angles to satisfy the, the fact that they have these areas. So this is what people call a diaphantine problem. Right? We have some description of our geometry, but that description is going to be restricted to only have certain values for those parameters. And so you can't have just a continuous version of like a ton of tetrahedra, uh, all satisfying the fact that their face one has area of a half a Planck length. Those are going to be very rare. So on the one hand, uh, we need many different tetrahedra in order or to do a path integral. Otherwise, there's no way you can kind of integrate over geometries. But on the other hand, our quantization condition has restricted us down to a few.
So uh, uh, I'm likening this to the Greek myth of Scylla and, and Charybdis, right? On the one hand, you have the fact that uh, we've made this quantization condition and that's reducing the number of states that are available. And so we have to avoid this sea monster. On the other hand, we have to impose that the dihedral angles have certain values or we are not going to get GR dynamics. So we also have to avoid the whirlpool. So there's this kind of double edged thing we have to be careful of. So we want to impose these constraints, but we want, don't want to impose them so strongly that there are no tetrahedra that are available that satisfy them. So that's the idea of this path integral. How are we going to do it? All right, so what I showed you was that the, the action had this additive factorization. That additive factorization means that the partition function, in other words, the exponential of the action, breaks up into a multiplicative uh, factorization. That multiplicative factorization associates amplitudes to each triangle. Those are the triangle pieces we talked about. It associates amplitudes to each simplex in the discretization. Those are the simplex pieces we talked about. But it also has gluing constraints. And these gluing constraints make sure that the dihedral angles match well enough that the geometry is close to a general relativistic geometry, uh, in other words, an Einstein geometry. Um, here, the amplitude factors, I'm just rewriting. I'm just plugging in the actions from the previous slide in the exponentials to get these two amplitude factors. But I haven't told you how I'm going to impose these gluing constraints. And this is where that loop quantum gravity Hilbert space comes in in a really beautiful way. The way I'm going to impose the gluing is I'm going to uh, pick coherent states, states that are peaked on a classical tetrahedron with a given dihedral angle to impose the gluing between the two simplicities. These coherent states have been well studied in the literature. They're just a version of the, the tetrahedral states that we've been talking about, but one where you're doing as best you can to specify the two conjugate, uh, the two related dihedral angles. And this defines for you a path integral. All right, as predicted, I'm going way too slowly to get through everything. Uh, I've now been able to define what I mean by an effective spin foam for you. And that's the main thing that I wanted to do for you. So uh, what is it? It's a sum over the J labels of a measure factor. In practice, you would like to use this measure factor to make diffeomorphism uh, symmetry work out well. Uh, however, <clears throat> in particular, you'd like to be able to retriangulate your manifold and not have that mean anything, not have it change anything, as long as it's just a retriangulation. Um, nobody has found the correct measure factor to do that yet. So what people do in practice is just work with the simplest possible measure factor, which is one. Um, but this is something that definitely needs further work. The amplitudes with the triangles and simplices are as we described them. And then uh, in an effective spin foam, we do a really uh, naive thing, but that's what makes it so numerically efficient. We just use a Gaussian peaked on these coherent states to impose the gluing. OK, there's tons more things to tell you, but at least this defines a spin foam for you. I'm going to skip over lots of the details here. You can read about them. Uh, happy to discuss them in the questions a little next time. Um, and, and today. Uh, but what I want to show you just very briefly is that this works. <laughs> so uh, here's a simple triangulation. Um, it's been what we could call it is symmetry reduced. We've set a lot of the area and length variables equal to each other in order to study this. It makes the number of parameters in the model smaller, and that makes it easier to study. Uh, but this is a gluing of um, six four simplices around one edge. In le length regi calculus, if you do that, you can calculate the length of that edge. You can calculate all the classical quantities associated with this. Um, 
I, I go through here and in the next slide the full details of how we describe this triangulation. I'm not going to take you through those right now. But the upshot was that we could actually run a spin foam model. So this is, we could calculate over the, the possibilities for the interpolating geometries, and we could find expectation values for the various parameters at the end of that calculation. The consequence of having imposed the constraints with coherent states is that we don't get real answers. This is a weird feature if you've never seen it before. So here I'm computing the curvature angle around a particular area in the triangulation, and you see it's a complex number. But what I want to highlight for you is that the complex piece, the imaginary piece here, is small. And, uh, and so this spin foam model, which we've only worked in such a, such a refinement as I showed you, that is, we didn't keep making the graph tighter and tighter, and presumably as you do, these numbers, the imaginary pieces get smaller and smaller. But look at the remarkable agreement between the classical theory and our quantum computation via this path integral. The curvature angle around this triangle is 3.22 in the classical theory. Here we're getting 3.19. Around this triangle, it's negative 1.32. In the classical theory, it's negative 1.36. Here it's negative 0.6. Here we're getting negative 0.6. So this is a quantum path integral that's really reproducing the dynamics, the, the length, Reggie, the metrical dynamics of this discretization uh, via path integral. So this was really exciting for us. And we did these computations in a few hours on our laptops. So this is, a, of course, massive, massive truncation of the theory, right? <laughs> We're dealing with a really, really small chunk of a dynamical space time here but it's, it's compelling that you can start to do these things. All right, with apologies for skipping over so many things, uh, I told you, uh, I mentioned to the organizers at the beginning, it's my mom's birthday. So I wanted to send something lovely to her and to continue our funny theme. Uh, so uh, on the left is my son when I first started doing a postdoc in Marseille and he came to visit me in my office and my office mate sat him down at his desk and this is what it looked like, which I thought was just fantastic. So this is Milo doing calculations in 2013. And I wanted to show you all that he's continuing his work on quantum gravity by studying falling cats uh, on the right. All right, thanks everybody. And I'll switch over to questions now. Thank you all, excellent thanks, question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, excellent lecture and also ending. <laughs> um, so we have three questions so far in the Q&A. Um, I think you can. Uh, maybe start with the first one by Mateus. Yeah, Mateus says, I don't understand how you can do this. You will not find surface terms. The least action principle is imposed in this path integral formalism. So I'm sorry, Mateus, I don't know exactly when you asked this, but I think you're worried about the, the discrete uh, Reggie calculus path integral and the fact that I didn't talk about the boundary action. Um, you're absolutely correct. I, I blew by that subtlety, um, but I actually did include it. I just didn't discuss it. Um, that's where this boundary term comes in. Um, so I mentioned it very briefly here, this N index. Uh, I told you that it's, it's here to account for the fact that some of these triangles are in the bulk and we're computing the deficit angle around them but some of these triangles are on the boundary of the discretization and they get a different action contribution. Uh, this different action contribution, it corresponds to what's called the gibbons hawking york term in standard general relativity. Um, and it was worked out in the discrete case by Hartle, uh, the wonderful James Hartle, who I mentioned recently passed away. Uh, he did the calculation in, in Reggie calculus much later in the 80s, if I remember correctly. So uh, while I didn't discuss it, this does have a well-defined action principle behind it. And that well-defined action principle has the correct boundary term. Uh, Deepan wonders, should there be a discrete curvature spectrum due to the area spectrum in Reggie calculus? Um, yeah, so... Um, um, 
there's been a lot of work on thinking about introducing curvature operators. And uh, curvature operators are a bit subtle. Um, I told you that the way that uh, we think about them most often are through these holonomies. Uh, the holonomies, though, are sort of non-local gauge invariant observables, right? They, they transverse several nodes in the network. And as such, you've gone out into a region of space-time and you're probing sort of the average curvature in that region. Uh, average isn't quite right, but you know the components of the curvature in that region. Um, uh, more local versions of probing the curvature as an operator have been introduced in, in canonical theory. Um, fortunately for us here in this uh, spin foam theory, we don't need to think of this as an operator, right? We're, we're simply writing down the, the classical variable, which is this deficit angle. Admittedly, it's discretized but it's a perfectly well-defined classical quantity and then we're doing the path integral to kind of get the quantum aspect of it to come out uh, all the subtleties about that quantum treatment come from the imp uh, imposing of the constraints as i tried to kind of discuss a little today okay uh sadeg wonders i do not know my question whether my question is true or not but i'm curious to know what we can say at the infinite tetrahedron triangles can create perfect sphere or symmetric form formation. Uh, good. Um, so I mentioned at the level of the canonical theory that you can give a well-defined graph limit. That is, you can uh, imagine taking uh, larger and larger graphs and you embed your spin network in the larger and larger graph and you get a further and further refinement of your spin network information. And uh, in that limit, you could describe the classical geometry, which is a perfect sphere. Um, so at that level, there's, there's no problem at all. In a path integral approach, uh, there's also no problem, but there's the practical consideration of how much you're going to actually refine and still be able to do the co computation on your computer. So uh, you, I, you would clearly see that as you refined the, the discretization you're using, you would get better and better approximations to the perfect spherical geometry. And the fact that you're really asking for it to be symmetrical, that's also going to allow you to cut down the variables and make things easier. Um, but as long as you're doing the computation in hardware, it's always going to be a finite computation and you're going to have to only refine so much. But this does motivate a really interesting question, which uh, you know many people have worked on, including Bianca Dietrich and Seth Assant, people who I did this effective spin foam work on uh, together with. Um, and one thing you can do is try to understand as I'm discretizing my sphere, uh, what happens as I treat that uh, at a, a finer scale, and can I kind of get a renormalization group flow? So can I understand uh, how the partition function changes under that refinement and actually build a differential equation or something like that that flows me to the continuum? Uh, so that's definitely something Bianca's worked on a lot and uh, has made a lot of progress on. Uh, I'm not sure I know whether they've actually perfectly recovered the spherical case or not. Uh, but, but at any rate, it's something of current interest and something that goes in this direction of renormalization that we mentioned earlier. Um, Idris is wondering... Uh, whether this was already discussed in the first lecture, but does the uh, gamma parameter, the barbaro mirzi parameter, provide an ambiguity in the quantum theory? Or should it eventually be fixed by some phenomenology? Uh, yes, it does uh, provide uh, an ambiguity. And uh, yes, ideally, we would know a measurement we could do to fix it in the theory. Um, there's been some work uh, where they've computed the black hole entropy in loop gravity. And at first it appeared that um, to get a match with the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, uh, 
you might need to fix the value of gamma. And that was a, a strategy to try to fix the parameter in the theory. Um, I think there's some debate in the community about whether that's the right way to think about the calculation that was done or not. And the debate stems from the fact that um, it's difficult to do the calculation of the entropy in the absence of any other fields in the theory. So you would really want to do the black hole entropy calculation, including matter degrees of freedom in the theory. And when you do that, there's actually a way of thinking about the calculation in which the gamma parameter cancels out and you get exactly the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So there's sort of a part of the community that thinks of gamma as being fixed by black hole entropy and another part of the community that thinks maybe it's actually still a free parameter that you get Bekenstein Hawking at lowest order automatically. Um, I tend to be in the second camp, but it's a it's a question where I haven't, that is, I think that the black hole entropy calculation is independent of gamma, but it's not something I've worked on too much myself, and so I shouldn't take too strong a stance on that. Um, you know, uh, to address your question in principle, we've already given the answer. If you could measure the discrete spectrum of areas, you would be able to extract the area gap in that spectrum and you would know what gamma was. So that would be a phenomenological answer. It's just this constant problem that the Planck scale is so far below our scales that we don't have any way to probe it yet. I think Bekenstein-Hawking entropy and thermal calculations are a brilliant way to attack this problem though. Um, you know, statistical uh, quantities are the quantities that are easiest to measure. So if you could find a consequence of gamma in the thermodynamics of gravity, that, that would be the best way, I think, to get at it. I'll talk about that a little bit more next time. Um, Deepan wonders how to get the effects of matter field and fermions uh, in the Reggie curvature in GR. Uh, wonderful question, Deepan. Um, so I mentioned this very briefly. Uh, fermions have been studied a, a bit in spin foam models, where there's a, a couple of models where they've just uh, figured out a way to include fermions in the, the metrical discussion that we've been giving. Um, I would like to see much more work on this. So I hope that many of you will take up fermions um, in particular, there's a very simple version of this that you might have noticed already in the last lecture. When I was describing the Gauss law, I was making this analogy with electromagnetism. And I was saying that if you had a charge on the interior of your Gaussian surface, then you could do the surface integral and f of the flux and figure out what charge was in there. Um, and when I went to the tetrahedron and I went to the, the gravitational case, I said, let's take the mass to be zero. And I said that this leads to this closure constraint. So the, the total gravitational flux added up to zero on the surface. But, um, but really, you should have that adding up to the mass. And so I would like to understand what that means at a spin network level. Um, I'd like to understand that that's a non-local effect, right? You're getting some information about the mass energy content of a region uh, f far from the region. It's the Coulomb, it's the analog of the Coulomb field in the gravitational case. And I would like to really understand the details of that in a way that I don't currently. Uh, so I think there's a lot to do in terms of including matter in these models and a lot to do in terms of understanding it much more deeply. Uh, Paikal says, the horizon of a black hole uh, looks as a surface. Shouldn't we look at it like a sheet because of the fuzziness of the polyhedra? Um, so I think... I'm not totally sure I get the the idea here, but I maybe I do. So yes, I agree with what you're saying. Um, uh, one of the ways to think about the calculation of the black hole entropy and loop gravity 
is uh, that we're taking the horizon of the black hole, say at a single instant of time, and asking about um, its polyhedralization. <laughs> that is, we're asking about all the ways that you could ar arrange the facets that would give the same horizon area. And uh, that's a beautiful way of computing the black hole entropy in loop gravity. Uh, and it's been done kind of in two different versions. Alejandro Perez has worked on this a lot, uh, but also Eugenio Bianchi has a very nice way of doing it uh, that's close to the polyhedral picture. Um, so yes, I, I agree with your intuition here that um, you can think of the black hole entropy as a consequence of the fact the the electric flux has been quantized on the horizon of the black hole. I can never see the raised hands. I don't know if somebody's got a raised hand. Uh, no, I think we're done with questions for today. Okay, that's fantastic. How it's um, so thank you, Hal, again. The next lecture will take place next Wednesday at the same time. It will be the last one. So see you all then. Bye bye. Thank you, Hal. Of course, thank you all.